So I'll get started now. Uh, lecture number 19. Um, not a, an overly difficult lecture, but does introduce some um, really cool stuff. And uh, at one point, uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, this was state-of-the-art reinforcement learning. But uh, it's pretty much as far as we're going to go with reinforcement learning. Um, because there's a lot more we could talk about, but uh, this is sort of an introductory class to a bunch of things, not an in-depth class in reinforcement learning. So we'll be talking about uh, on-policy versus off-policy learning, then temporal difference learning, and then we'll introduce SARSA and Q-learning, which are um, two of the more famous temporal difference learning algorithms. And if you want to follow along in the textbook, there's lots more to be said about this, um, and you can, you can read about it there. So first, the concept of on-policy versus off-policy learning. Um, so recall the Monte Carlo Exploring Starts algorithm that we presented before. And what was happening there is that we used the current policy to update the values that we believe that policy has, and then we use those values to update that same policy. right? And we're improving the same policy that's being used to make the decision and guide the learning. And whenever we do this, whenever we use the same policy that we then update, then that's called on-policy learning. Very, very simple definition. And so off-policy learning means that um, off-policy methods learn a different policy that's than the one that's used to generate the data. So for example, if we were learning a policy by observing random actions, then that would be off-policy. Because we're using a different policy to learn than, or sorry, we're learning a different policy than the one that's being used to generate the actions. So this is what we did last time. Um, this was the Monte Carlo policy iteration algorithm that we presented. So we have our Q values and our policy. And if we notice here, we generate an episode based on P, that policy. And then we use those values to then update P itself, right? So we're generating an episode with the policy, and then we are updating that policy. And this is called on policy. So we generate the episodes based on the policy, right? And just to really drive it home, if we had done something like a randomized Monte Carlo, where instead of generating the episodes with the policy, we generated the episodes based on random actions, and then we updated our policy, then this would be called off policy learning. And so if I'm saying it this often, it's probably a good exam question. What's the difference between on and off policy learning? Well, now you know what that is. So on policy updates the same policy that is used to generate the actions, and off policy uses different, uh, a different policy to generate the actions. The important part here is that on policy, if the policy that we're using to generate the actions is doing something like epsilon greedy, for example, then on policy learning, the policy that you learn takes the exploration into account. And this might not be obvious immediately, but I will go into an example a bit later of why this is. And because off policy learning is learning a different policy, it may not be taking that exploration into account. And so it may have poor online performance, but it may have better performance after the training phase has been done. And I'll, again, I'll have an example of why that is later. So on policy uh, control methods. In on policy, um, because we have to do some sort of exploration, the policy is generally what we call soft. And the definition of a soft policy is just that every action has a chance to be taken that's non-zero. Okay? So for our policy pi for every action at a given state is greater than zero for all states and actions. And as it learns, the policy moves toward a deterministic optimal policy. Um, and so one example of on policy methods is to use epsilon greedy to select actions, right? And then if we're using epsilon greedy, then every action has a chance to be performed because there's that random chance. And so that will be considered a soft policy. So epsilon greedy on policy control. Now, you know, a few lectures ago, you wouldn't have known what that meant, but now, now you know what this means. So with probability epsilon, choose a random action. So if I have probably, probability epsilon to choose a random action, it means that with probability 1 minus epsilon, we are choosing the greedy action. Or if there are multiple greedy actions, then we divide 1 minus epsilon divided by the number of greedy actions, right? But let's just, it's easier to think about if we think about one greedy action. So in an epsilon greedy policy, non-greedy actions have probability epsilon 
divided by, and this is just the cardinality of the set of all actions, which is just the number of actions, right? Um, and greedy actions have probability, well, here I said 1 minus epsilon, but if you think about it, they also have a chance to be selected randomly, right? So if I ask you on an exam to calculate the probabilities of each action being chosen, remember that there is this as well. And I'll show a numerical example of that in a bit. And so this is an example of an epsilon soft policy because everything has a chance to be selected. So Monte Carlo uh, GPI, generalized policy iteration, epsilon soft. So on, on policy, Monte Carlo is still just generalized policy iteration. So we'll use the first visit Monte Carlo to perform the policy evaluation and to estimate the values of our current policy. Um, and remember, without these exploring starts that we looked at last time, we may have a lot of state action pairs that go unvisited. So whenever you're doing this, make sure you use exploring starts if possible, um, and also to use something like epsilon greedy to make sure that uh, all actions get selected eventually. So epsilon soft on policy methods ensure that exploration occurs, which is what we want, and all state action pairs eventually get visited. However, the policy that we learn is now only optimal within all of the epsilon soft policies. But in practice, it's still, still quite good. So what that means is, on policy, we are generating actions with a policy that have some randomness in it because they're soft. And so the policy that we end up learning is going to be soft, meaning that the eventual policy is still going to have some randomness in it. Right? which is not necessarily what we want. And so this is one of the downfalls of on-policy methods. Um, so on-policy methods update the policy with the randomness of epsilon greedy included, or whatever other method that you're using for exploration. If the environment is hazardous, features with strong, or sorry, if the environment has hazardous features with strong negative rewards, then epsilon greedy will encounter those features. Right? So if we're next to a cliff, and I have a big example of this later, and we're doing epsilon greedy, we may fall off of that cliff. And so one of the byproducts of this is that on policy learning, while it's learning, we'll learn to avoid these things which are dangerous if there's randomness. But if there's no actual randomness in the environment, and the only randomness comes from the random selection of actions, then this may not be something that we desire. So this results in a policy that can be overly cautious. Right? Because we have this random chance of, of selecting dangerous things and not sort of this globally optimal policy that we would love to have eventually. So let's have a look at this algorithm to cover what we've done so far. So this is on policy first visit Monte Carlo, um, epsilon soft. So we have our Q values and our P values, um, which we'd covered before. And then we repeat forever. Um, so however much learning we want to do, generate an episode using our policy. Then for each state action reward tuple in the episode, um, we compute the sum of the reward, so that's just the return, following the first occurrence, because this is first visit. Then we have our step size update function. Um, we've already done that, so we update our Q values. And then for each state in the episode, we are going to select the action, which maximizes that QSA value. This is just the greedy action selection. And then for each action, here is our update rule. Right? So using the formula we just learned, either the action is one of the maximizing actions or it's not. Right? It's one of the greedy actions or it isn't. So if it is the greedy action, then the probability of that is 1 minus epsilon plus its chance of randomly occurring, which is epsilon divided by the number of actions. Otherwise, if it's not a maximum action, then it's just epsilon divided by the number of actions. And so in practice, um, this formula here only works if there is a single maximum action. So just remember that you may have to divide this by the number of maximum actions if you want the greedy actions to have an equal probability of being selected. Depending on the, the scenario, you may want there to be a single greedy action. And if there's two things with different, um, sorry, two things which maximize the value, then you may want to divide 1 minus epsilon by 2 if there's two things, by three, if there's three things, et cetera. So here again, um, I'm going to do an example now. Uh, and we've seen this. This is going to be basically what's happening in our assignment. So we have this grid world. We have, say, up, down, left, and right, for example. So these are our action numbers. And so here's an example um, calculation. So this is the 
This is the formula that I just showed, which is part of that algorithm. So now let's look at some numbers. Let's say that we have um, an epsilon equal to 0 0.1. So that's a 10% chance of choosing a random action and a number of actions equal to 5. So I got 5 actions. So watch the chance that we'll select any action randomly. It would be 0.1 divided by 5. And so, so that would be how many percent? 2%, right? So 0.02. So if we have QSA at a particular state um, equal to, and the values of these actions at this state are 10, 20, 15, 5, 10, well, we've got a single maximum action here. And so A star, oh, that's a poor choice of variable name. It's not the A star algorithm. It's just the best action. Uh, that's equal to 1. That's the, action, uh, the index of the maximum action. And so when we go to update our policy here, in order to have this soft policy, all of our actions are going to have 0.1 divided by 5 chance of being selected, but the greedy action also has 1 minus 0.1 chance of being selected. So what we see in the end is all of our actions have that 2% chance of being selected, but the greedy action has that extra 90% chance of being selected, right? And of course, this formula, again, it, if there were two 20s there, then you'd have 45% for each plus 2. Right? So you just have to divide that by the, the number of maximums um, whenever you do that calculation. So that's a pretty easy calculation. So that's what your policy would look like. And now you can see why, OK, I'm training my, my um, policy with this on policy method using epsilon soft. And the policy I get out in the end has this random chance of doing some things. Right? So whether or not I want to actually do that in practice is uh, something that we'll have to have a look at. So what is the solution? to that? Well, off policy methods. So here is the learning control methods dilemma. We wish to learn action values based on what we currently believe to be optimal behavior, but we need to behave non-optimally in order to explore the state and action space to find the optimal behavior. So that's why this happens, right? That's why we have this policy that still explores. It's because we have to explore in order to make sure that we can learn enough. So this is really the dilemma. So on policy epsilon soft methods compromise by finding a near optimal policy that still explores. Um, but another approach is to actually use two different policies. One is called the target policy. So the target policy is the policy that we're actually learning over time. So that's where we're sticking all the stuff that we actually learn as we do our reinforcement learning. And the behavior policy is the policy that we're using to generate the episodes. And they're actually not the same policy. And so if we're learning from data that is off of the target policy, that is off policy learning. So we got on policy, off policy learning. On policy methods are a little bit simpler in practice, right? Just conceptually, it's simpler to do them. However, so and that's because off policy methods may require additional concept. Maybe they have some higher variance, and they may actually converge slower than on policy methods. But in general, off policy methods are more powerful. Um, and I mean, you can just consider on policy methods to be a special case of off policy methods, where the two policies just happen to be the same. right? So we can actually categorize on policy as off policy if we really want to. And we'll get back to this um, when we talk about SARSA and Q learning, because one of those is off policy and one of them is on policy. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that near the end of, of the lecture. So temporal difference learning, um, that's what we're going to talk about next. And it ties together really nicely the idea of some of the ideas of dynamic programming and some of the ideas of Monte Carlo and combines the good parts of them and throws away the bad parts of them. And this is uh, chapter six in the reinforcement learning textbook. And if you're studying for the exam using the textbook, you can stop once you get to the point where they've discussed Q learning, because that's as far as we're going um, in this course. The textbook, this is probably, we're like a quarter of the way through the textbook um, when we stop the reinforcement learning part of the course. So there's lots, of, lots more stuff to go through, or lots more stuff to do if you want to continue on with reinforcement learning. So temporal difference learning is one of the central ideas of reinforcement learning. 
Now, it has since really kind of fallen out of fashion. It is no longer like the strongest type of reinforcement learning you can do. Um, but in terms of tabular reinforcement learning methods that I consider to be appropriate for this course, again, because it's just an intro to a bunch of things, um, this is one of the most important things that we want to talk about. And it combines the ideas presented in Monte Carlo and in dynamic programming. So like Monte Carlo, uh, TD methods, temporal difference methods, learn directly from experience without a model of the environment. So that's the good thing that it takes from Monte Carlo, is we don't need this model. We don't need to know all the state probability distribution stuff. We just need experience. However, like dynamic programming, it incorporates other learned estimates without waiting for the final outcome of an episode. Right? This is called bootstrapping in some um, textbooks, but this is a really good thing. Maybe we don't want to wait for the end of an episode in order to update our values or something like that. And so this relationship is, is pretty important and you know, could possibly be a, an exam question. So TD prediction. Both TD and Monte Carlo use experience to predict the value of our policy. So that's good. That's what we want. Monte Carlo waits for an episode to finish and then updates the value based on the final return. We talked about that already. We wait for the whole episode to finish, and then we get our return. We calculate our return. Then we go back for each state action pair, and based on the return, we update the values of each state action pair. TD methods do not wait for the end of an episode, and instead, we're going to update the values after each time step. So every single time we take an action and we get a reward, we're going to do the update right away. We're not going to wait. And a good thing about this is now we can apply these to continuing tasks. right? We don't need to wait for episodes to finish. And so Monte Carlo methods, strict Monte Carlo methods that wait for episodes to finish, you can't use them for continuing tasks because there's no end to the episode. right? So the TD prediction target, um, Monte Carlo methods use the episode return. right? So if we're talking about the estimating the value of a state, then the value of a state is based on this is the target value right here, which is the episode return, g of t. So we have a current estimate, then we add our fixed size alpha times the new, sorry, the return from this episode minus our previous belief of that state. However, temporal difference learning uses instead of the return, we can't wait for a return. We're doing it after each action. So it uses the reward plus the next state value as the target. So this right here as the target. So RT plus 1, that's the reward we get immediately after taking that action, plus gamma times the value of the next state. So TD updates immediately after transitioning to state T plus 1 and receiving reward T plus 1. Um, and so TD's target value is the next, the next reward plus gamma times the value of the next state. And this is called TD0, or one-step TD. If you are super keen and you read further in the book, TD0, you can see that 0 there is probably a parameter, and it is. So there's something called TD lambda, which we can vary this parameter of lambda to, a, to actually take future rewards into account, or future state values into account as well. But I'm just going to stop at TD0, and this is the target that we're worrying about. So don't worry about um, other values like TD1 or TD lambda. We're just doing TD0. So tabular TD0 for estimating um, the value of a policy. Here it is. So we have V of S, which is the initial value for each state. We just come up with those. Maybe they're, um, they're 0. Then we repeat forever for each episode. Um, so state, the state is the, initialize, uh, the initial state for each episode. Then we repeat for each step of each episode. Um, A is the action given by our policy for the state, so we see which action we're going to do. We then do the action at A, and we get S prime, which is just ST plus 1, that's the next state. Then we get the reward from doing A at S, and then we immediately update our belief of the value. Okay, So our value is equal to the previous value, plus alpha times R plus gamma times V of S prime minus V of S. So we do it right away without waiting for the episode to finish. And then um, we also have, then we set s equal to s prime. So here I'm saying, OK, for each episode. But if you have a continuing task that is not based on episodes, you can just say for each step. right? You don't need to have this episode um, in there. 
So TD uses the next state value in the estimate. But how can we just change the target value and have the math still work out? Well, it turns out that we already did this in the dynamic programming lecture, right? So V pi of S, oh my god, I'm getting a phone call. I put it on silent. Apparently, do not disturb does not work for phone calls. So apologies for that. OK, where was I? So the value of a state, the estimate that we're keeping, is equal to the expected value of the return. right? But due to the Bellman equation and due to dynamic programming, this is equal to the expected value of the return, the reward that we get, plus gamma times the return at the next state. And the return at the next state is just the value of the next state. And so what we're doing here is that Monte Carlo methods use the return of an episode as the target. But mathematically, this is the same as 3. And so dynamic programming and TD methods use number 3 as the target, which is cool. The math still works out as long as we have enough samples. And so TD combines the Monte Carlo sampling with the dynamic programming update. So this is a lot of text. I'm going to read this verbatim because I think it's a good example, and it's from the textbook, and it kind of illustrates the difference, in my opinion, of the Monte Carlo update versus the TD update um, really well. So each day as you drive home from work, you try to predict how long it will take to get home. When you leave the office, you note the time, the day of the week, the weather, and anything else that might be relevant. So say on this Friday you're leaving at exactly 6 o'clock, and you estimate that it will take 30 minutes to get home. So you have this initial estimate. Okay, I'm leaving at 6. It's going to take 30 minutes for me to get home. That's my value. That's my current predicted value of this state. As you reach the car, it's 6.05, and you notice that it's starting to rain. Traffic is often slower in the rain, so you re-estimate that it will take 35 minutes from then, or a total of 40 minutes. 15 minutes later, you've completed the highway portion of your journey in good time. As you exit onto a secondary road, you cut your estimate of total travel time to 30 minutes. Unfortunately, at this point, you get stuck behind a slow truck, and the road is too narrow to pass. You end up having to follow the truck until you turn onto the side street where you live at 640. Three minutes later, you're at your home. The sequence of state, action, times, and predictions is thus as follows. So when I was leaving the office, zero minutes had passed and I predicted that I had 30 minutes to go, right? Think of these as the states of the episode, okay? After five minutes, I reached my car. I had another observation. I had an observation of that state that it was now raining, right? So I predicted that there's going to be 35 minutes to go, so my total predicted time went up a little bit. Then I'm exiting the highway. I had actually made good time, so I went faster than I thought I would. Maybe there wasn't enough, uh, as much traffic. So I predicted that I had about 15 minutes to go, total time of 35 minutes. Then um, I exit the secondary road. I'm now behind a truck. So I update my value. OK, this is going to take an extra five minutes. So now I'm back to 40. Then I finally enter my home street. I know there's three minutes to go. So my final predicted value is 43 minutes. And then I arrive at home at 43 minutes. And so what's going to happen here is that a Monte Carlo method wouldn't care about any of these intermediate re-updating steps. It would just say 43 minutes. That's how long it took me to get home. Whereas TD would care about each of these steps. So what we see is something like this. So for a Monte Carlo method, we have the actual outcome, which is 43 minutes. And what we do is, after the episode is over, we would go back and update our value estimates for each state to be closer to that um, initial value, or the, that final value, the actual return of the episode. So if we had a fixed size alpha of uh, 0.5, for example, all of our estimates would go half of the way toward that. However, a TD method will be doing an update at each step. So we observe something new at each step, we make an update, right? And so this is what happened, what's happening. I have observed here that, oh, it's raining, so I'm updating my, my estimate to be a higher value. Then I, I made good time, so okay, now it goes down five. Now I'm stuck behind a truck, so now it goes up five, et cetera. So this is the difference. The difference, Monte Carlo, 
the whole episode, each state action pair's value goes toward the final one, versus in TD, you're doing a more fine-grained update as you go. Now, I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than the other in all possible state, in all possible cases. For example, if we're doing something like blackjack, our reward at every state except the terminal one is zero. So would it even make sense to use something like TD for something like blackjack if we're not necessarily getting any rewards? Right? It may, it may not. I'm not 100% sure. But just keep in mind that this is what the value updates look like. So some of the advantages of uh, temporal difference learning is that dynamic programming requires a model, whereas MC and TD do not. Uh, Monte Carlo waits until an episode is finished to do the update. TD is online and incremental. Um, so sometimes episodes are very long, and so that's something that MC would have to deal with. And of course, continuing tasks have no episodes, so you can't use um, traditional Monte Carlo for those. TD methods to converge faster than fixed sized alpha Monte Carlo methods. But as of the time that I wrote this, it was not proven. OK, so that's how we update the values. How do we do control for TD, meaning how do we actually update our, uh, our policy? Well, we discussed it for prediction. Given a policy, what is the value? How do we update the policy? Well, it's just GPI. The GPI is basically the same for everything, right? So like Monte Carlo, we have the same exploitation versus exploration trade-off. And like Monte Carlo, we have on policy versus off policy as well. So on policy, TD control, um, everything we've done so far, we've looked at values of states. But of course, if we want to do control, we need state action pairs. We need to know the value of doing actions in order to select the correct action. So uh, we need to estimate Q pi of SA for the current behavior policy pi and for all the state action pairs. And so we can use the same TD methods that we talked about before for estimating the value of a state, but we just use Q of SA instead of V of S. So the first such algorithm is called SARSA. And so SARSA is on policy TD control. And so this is just the diagram that I've shown before. State, action, reward. State, action, reward. This is what's happening for our MDP reinforcement learning. Episodes consist of state, action, reward. And previously, we looked at um, an algorithm that was nameless that um, learned for TD to transition between episode states and update V of S, which is the value of a state. But instead, SARSA is going to update the value of state action pairs. Okay? And so the, the interesting thing, the unique thing about SARSA is that Q of S A T is equal to, okay, my previous value plus alpha times the reward that I get plus gamma times Q of S T plus 1 A T plus 1. So the value of state T plus 1 that we have to replace with Q S A actually goes and says, what would I actually do at the next state? Okay, so it follows the policy. That's why it's on policy. So when we go to find the value of the next state, it involves the thing that we would actually do at the next state. So that's one of the main differences between SARSA and Q learning, which we'll see in a second. So here we go. This is the update rule. That should be regurgitatable for an exam. It's, it's not super difficult. All you have to do is remember this target, and the rest of it fits in. So if st plus 1 is terminal, then q of st at plus 1 is 0. So we'll just set it to 0. The policy update is greedy with respect to qsa. And the formula makes use of the following data. So we have st at, uh, rt plus 1, st plus 1, and at plus 1. So there are five different variables here. sarsa, that's sarsa. So that's how you remember the algorithm. Um, that's how you remember how to write it down. Um, that's, at least that's how I remember to write it down. It's named with the, uh, with the variables that it uses. So if you want the algorithm, SARSA using epsilon greedy, same as we saw before. Um, so QSA is some initial value. Uh, if we have a terminal uh, value, then it's just zero. Then repeat for each episode. If you don't have episodes, this will still work. So S is the initial starting state. A is choose action at S using epsilon greedy on all the actions um, in S. Then repeat for each step of the episode. Take action A at state S. We get the reward, and we get the next state. Then um, A prime. So we need to look at what we would actually do at that next state. So that's choosing A prime from S prime using epsilon greedy on S prime 
all the actions. So we look at the next action that we would do at the next state, and now we have all the things that we need, and so QSA is equal to QSA plus alpha times the reward plus gamma times the value of the action we would take at the next state if we were to do it minus the value of the current one, and then we update, okay, S is S prime and A is A prime. So pretty simple algorithm, really easy to implement. So that's SARSA. Next, the thing we're going to compare this to is Q-learning. So Q-learning is off-policy TD control. Um, this was invented in 1989, so no, it is not the most modern of algorithms, but it has shaped a lot of what has come since, um, since then in reinforcement learning. And so what we do here, the difference between SARSA and Q-learning is SARSA will just take the value of what we would actually do at the next state. Okay, so this is very important. SARSA looks at the next state and says, what would we actually do based on our epsilon soft policy at that state? Q-learning looks at the next state and says, what is the best action that we could do at the next state? Okay, so we look over all the actions, and regardless of what our policy would tell us to do, we choose the highest valued action there. And that's the difference between the two algorithms. And because we're looking at the value of the best thing we could do instead of the thing we would actually do, we are no longer learning the values of the policy that we're taking. We're learning the values of something else, which is the best thing that we could do. And so the learned Q value directly approximates Q star, which would be the optimal value if we knew it, the optimal action value function, no matter which behavior policy is being followed. So that's kind of crazy. No matter what we use to generate the actual actions, Q-learning is approximating the best thing that we could do. So what we could do with Q-learning is just take random actions and then learn what the best thing we could do is based on those random actions. And it would actually learn an, an optimal policy, even if we're using random actions. So Q-learning using epsilon greedy, very, very similar to um, SARSA, it's actually easier to implement because we don't need to do that step of looking up, ah, I'd say they're, okay, they're about equal to implement. So it's about equal until we get to here. And here, the only difference is we have to look at the next state, we have to look over all the actions and calculate the maximum valued action and then return it there. That's the only difference. That's it. So if I ask you to state the, the SARSA formula and the Q-learning formula, SARSA just says, what would we do at the next state? Q-learning says, what's the best thing to do at the next state? So why is Q-learning considered off-policy? Well, I talked about this a little bit already. If the algorithm estimates the value function of the policy generating the data, then the method is called on-policy. So SARSA learns the value of its own policy, which does exploration. But Q-learning learns the value of a policy which does not explore because it's taking the best thing you could do at the next state, not the exploration that you would take into account at the next state, since it takes this max action value. So this is an example which illustrates, I hope, really well the difference between this sort of on-policy SARSA and the off-policy Q-learning, and it is hopefully a lesson to take forward with you if you do any reinforcement learning in the future. Because even though this example uses SARSA and Q-learning specifically, it really is a lesson in on-policy versus off-policy learning. Okay? So this is called the cliff, and it's straight out of the textbook, and you can read about it in the textbook, but let me just read this real quick. So the actions are up, down, left, and right. You get a negative reward at each time step, and if you step over the cliff, you get a, negative re a, roar, a reward of negative 100 and get set back to the start. And it's designed to show the difference between Q-learning and SARSA methods in online performance. So... Let's do this, and we're going to use epsilon greedy, okay? So let's say, for example, we're walking along, and we happen to find ourselves right here, okay? So if we are right here, and we are doing an update with SARSA, what does it say to do? It says, okay, I'm going to take an action here. Let's say that action is to the right. And then it says, update it with the value of the action that I would do here. But my, my policy is epsilon soft, meaning that I have a small chance of doing each action. So when I'm looking at the value of the next state, it's taking that exploration into account and saying, oh, this is actually like 
not an excellent state to be in because there is a small chance of me walking off the cliff. And so when I do the updates with Sarsa, every now and then I will get that huge negative reward, right? However, with queue learning, I'm doing my action here, and then I say, okay, my value is equal to that reward, plus the best thing that I could do at the next state. So it would look at the next state over here, and this, if I've been learning for a while, it would say, oh, that's a, that's a good value. Just go to the right. You're getting closer, right? So what will happen here is that we will see, during training, Sarsa will actually take this safer path away from the cliff because Sarsa is learning with respect to that Epsilon soft policy. It knows, hey, there's something going on where I'm actually taking random actions sometimes, and if I'm closer to the cliff, then my overall reward during the training phase is going to be lower if I'm closer to the cliff. Okay? Q learning, when it's performing its actions, it still does the epsilon soft thing. It still does exploration. But when it gets the value of the neighboring state, it gets the best action that it could do at that state. And so it knows it's completely safe to walk across the cliff. Right? So here's the interesting thing. You may say, well, Q learning is going to produce way better values. But with any learning task, there are two phases. One is the training phase, and the other is once I've completed my training and then I've made my policy and then I ship my policy to wherever, your Netflix recommender algorithm or whatever, there's two different phases. During training, if there is exploration going on in the training, and one of the algorithms is taking that exploration into account, i.e. Sarsa, the online method, during training, Sarsa is going to look way better. Because during training, it's avoiding the cliff. right? So it is not close to that cliff to get those random actions popping it off and getting negative rewards. Q-learning is like it's really confident in itself. right? It's walking next to that cliff knowing that OK, well, the next action is going to be fine. I'll just take the best thing there. And so during training, Q-learning is going to be taking itself along that cliff more often. And because we are generating episodes, generating actions using Epsilon Greedy, it is going to be getting, every now and then, more huge negative rewards than Sarsa. right? Because during training, we have to explore. So you look at this, and now your boss tells you, oh, um, well, you should probably use Sarsa. It's better. But what happens when you take the policies and you're no longer training? You're no longer exploring? Well, SARS's policy is going to say take that safe route, and Q-Learning's policy is still saying go along, you know, go along the cliff. But when you're no longer exploring, you're no longer using Epsilon soft policy, you're no longer using Epsilon greedy, Q-Learning is now completely safe. Right? After the training phase, Q-Learning is just going right across. And so after, during the training step, Q learning may look worse. But in this case, if you then take both policies and implement them, Q learning will actually perform much better. So it's this deceptive thing where you look at the training phase and you're like, that's weird. Why is that? And this is sort of the reason why that is. This is not specific to SARSA and Q learning. This is a phenomenon which goes on with on policy versus off policy learning. So just realize that what you're looking at in training does not necessarily reflect the quality of the eventual learned policy that you want to be using in, your, in production or whatever. So hopefully that was uh, somewhat intuitive. <laughs> Read the book if it, if it wasn't. So Q learning learns the values for the optimal policy, which travels at the edge of the cliff. This results in it sometimes falling off the cliff in training because of the epsilon greedy action selection during training. Sarsa takes this epsilon greedy action selection into account and learns the longer but safer path. It's on policy, so it learns the values of the policy that guides it. So even though Q learning learns the values of the optimal policy, its online performance is worse, meaning its training phase performance may be worse than an on policy one. So, Q learning is this tabular form of reinforcement learning up here where we have, here's our QSA. So tabular just meaning we can store these values in a table, right? So we've got an array that's big enough. 
But how would you apply an algorithm like Q-learning if you can't store everything in a table? Well, it turns out, and I'll get a little bit into this in a future lecture, not too much, that there's an al algorithm called deep Q-learning. And what it does is it essentially, there's a lot of hand-waving going on here and a lot of algorithmic excellence that goes on. But a very abstract way of looking at it is that instead of using a table, we use a neural net. And so that's what DQN is. Um, that's what deep Q learning is. It's Q learning, but the update rule is used to guide the training of a neural network as a function approximator rather than an explicit table for holding all the values. So exam questions, possible exam questions, off policy versus on policy. Um, why is SARSA considered on policy? Why is Q learning off policy? Why do SARSA and Q learning produce different um, paths through the example of the cliff? Why might you have, um, I don't have this explicitly listed, but why might on policy look better during training? Um, TD methods borrow ideas from both Monte Carlo and dynamic programming. What are they? SARSA and Q learning algorithms. Just these are ideas for questions. They don't, um, it's not necessarily everything that I could possibly ask. Okay, so I apologize profusely for having gone through that at laser speed, but I, I wanted to have as much time as possible to, uh, to explain the assignment. So um, if you do have any questions, again, I gladly answer them, just save them for after the explanation of the assignment. So let me see if I can maximize this here so I can give you as much room as possible. Why can I not full screen this? Come on. OK, whatever. This is fine. So here is assignment five. Surprise, surprise, we're living in a grid world so that we can do tabular stuff, right? So in this uh, user interface, I've got an agent in an environment. If I right click, I can set the position of the agent in the environment. That is only for your debugging and testing purposes. That has actually nothing to do with the assignment itself. So you can right click around um, to set the agent's position within the environment. In this environment, it obviously has a width and a height. And you can see a couple of different colors here. So for example, there are white tiles with a little cross inside them. Those white tiles are clear tiles, and it is legal for the agent to walk on those clear tiles. Okay? And the cross inside it represents the policy. So right now, we have an equiprobable random policy. And so that just says, go up, down, left, and right with equal probability. And the way that I draw this is I take the policy from the reinforcement learning thing that you're about to do, and I draw a line in every legal direction with a length equal to the probability that I should take that. So if I should go all the way to the left, this is going to be a longer line just showing to the left. And we'll see that in, in a second. There are two other types of tiles. The dark gray tiles are just walls. It is not legal to walk on a wall. And the blue tiles are terminal nodes. And so terminal goal, this is a continuing task. And so what happens here is that when your agent goes from a clear tile to a terminal tile, it doesn't end. It just teleports you to another random spot on the map. So that's what's going to happen. It's a continuing task. When you get to a terminal state, you get the reward from reaching the terminal state, and you go bloop, and you're somewhere else. So that it's, that's the exploring starts part of, this, um, part of this, is that once you finish an episode, you go to, um, again, there's no episodes, but once you finish a quote unquote episode, you go to another place in the map. In this environment, the legal actions are up, down, left, and right, but every action is always legal. Okay? So if I'm right here, for example, going left is legal, but what will happen is I take the action of going left, I get a negative one reward, and then I just stay in the same spot. Okay? So it's always legal to go there, but where you end up is just going to be different. So for example, up here, going up, down, left, and right are all legal. I'm going to get a negative one reward from doing all of them, but going up and going right are just going to leave me in that location. That's it. So what, over here, we have some uh, parameters. We have different maps, so a tiny environment, uh, a mini environment, a large environment. Okay, so different environments. I'll leave it on the default for now. And I have different things that I can do with the mouse. So right now what happens is if I click, left click, it says print values. What does print values do? 
Well, print values down here in the bottom left will print out um, different debugging stuff for these states. So if I click here, this says reward of uh, row or column three, x value three, y value nine. The reward for stepping onto that uh, tile is negative one. So if I go to a clear tile, I get negative one. The values are initially all zero, and the policy is initially equiprobable random. So you have a 0.2% of going up, down, left, or right. OK, so that's what that means. The other things that can happen here, I have insert wall in which I can change the map to insert a wall. I can clear a tile so it becomes clear from a wall. I can insert a terminal stage uh, step. I can set the reward of a particular step by clicking it. So I can manually set the reward. Oh, geez, I've got to set it. OK. Or I can move the agent. So now instead of right click moving me, left click will move me. And that's for the Mac users out there who complained last time <laughs> that right clicking is actually kind of hard. So you can move the agent with that. So let's refresh and explain these. So our Q-learning algorithm has a few different um, variables in it. And those variables are alpha, epsilon, gamma, and, well, this, this is not Q-learning, but this is iteration. So that's what those are. I've set some initial values there. You don't have to change them. So what happens is, if my agent, for example, is right here, and I click on single iteration, it's going to look up in the policy what it should do. It's going to find an action. It's going to do that action. Then it's going to get a reward. Then it's going to apply the Q-learning formula, update the values, and then apply the policy update and update the policy. So let's look at an example of that way down here where I can actually debug the values. Um, so down here, I'm at this step. I've clicked on it. And so it says the reward is negative 1. Uh, the values are currently all 0. So I have no estimate of any of my values. And this is the, the policy. So I just need to click up here. And I'm going to click single iteration. Single iteration does one iteration of that. And so I was here, right? So I was here. I chose go to the left. Now this has been colored with red. Negative values are colored red. Positive values are colored green. What you can see here is I chose to go to the left. I got a reward of negative 1. My alpha value is 0.1. My gamma value is 1. Gamma is 1 because we're just going to weight all the rewards equally. So down here, if it's up, down, left, right, then this is the value of up, the value of down, the value of left, the value of right. I went to the left. So this, I got a reward of negative 1 for going left multiplied by my alpha value. So I was at 0, right? Then I got a negative 1 reward. My alpha value is 0.1, so I go 10% of the way from 0 to 1, which is negative 0.1. And so this is how you will debug your program to know that your update step is working correctly, because you should get 0.1 there if that happens. And now with these values, I then update my policy. And if this is negative 0.1 and the rest are 0, then the zeros are the maximums. So now what should happen is I'm going to select equiprobable from all of these um, and so that's 0 0.3, 0 0.3. I'm not going to go left and then 0 0.3. So I see up, down, and right have an equiprobable chance of there. Now let me go back there and I'll do one more iteration. And I'll show you the update. So I chose going right randomly. And now going right has this value of um, negative 0.1. And you can see now that I have an equiprobable chance of going up and down. OK? So that's how you would debug your stuff. And if I click toggle iteration, what will happen is this is running at 60 frames per second. And it says toggle iteration 60 times per second, it will do this many iterations. So if I click toggle iteration, it will just start learning on its own. The different value, the different colors of red, just the darker the red, the more negative it is. And if we learn forever, it basically becomes the, re the value of an action at a state is approximately equal to the distance from one of the terminal states. 
So what I can do here in order to speed up the learning is I can just put this to 1,000. Now it's doing 1,000 learning iterations per frame. And almost instantaneously, it learned what to do. Right? So let me zoom in for illustrative purposes. And so it, it took a very short amount of time to figure out the policy for this environment. Right? So what's the quickest way to get to one of these terminal steps? Well, from here, it's moving to the left. From here, it says go up or left. I don't care. It's both equally far. But look at this one. This one says up, left, or right. Why? Because it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 from this one. And it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 from this one. Now, that only makes sense if those two terminal states have the same reward. Because this is not strictly a pathfinding problem. It's a reward or a expected return maximization problem. And if we click on one of these terminal states, we see that the reward is 0. So it's saying, how can I learn to do something if the reward from doing that thing is 0? Well, the reward of doing everything else is negative. So this is positive in comparison. right? But watch this. If I actually come up here and I say, all right, let's set the reward of this one. Instead of being 0, it's going to be 5. All right. So now this one is 5. So when I turn the learning back on, watch what happens. Right? So even some of the ones that are closer, let's turn the learning off, to this one are now wanting to go, like this one even wants to go this way because it can get to that 5. It'll give it more reward over time than going here. Right? So positive rewards are shown in green. Negative rewards are shown in red. And this is a reward maximization problem. And this doesn't only work for static environments like this. So let me just go quickly to the large environment. So if I go to the large environment, and I've got to zoom out a little bit, uh, I'm going to crank this up just a little bit. And let's toggle those iterations. Done. OK, we're finished learning already, right? It's, a, it's such a fast algorithm. It's so easy to do these updates. Now, let me just continue that learning. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert some walls. So what happens if I insert a wall here? Well, it will learn dynamically to go to this one, because going down here is no longer um, a good thing to do. Now, again, this is assuming that all the rewards of these things are 0. The reason why we want to use a fixed sized alpha update in this example is for exactly that. Because if I was just doing the average update, and I was learning millions and millions and millions of time steps, and then I change the map by inserting a wall, it would be millions and millions and millions of time steps before my policy changed because it was averaging it. So what this does is it's saying, hey, this is actually a dynamic environment that can change. Let's insert another terminal one over here. And look, it'll learn to do that. Now, the reason why this is taking so long to learn is because, for example, if I were to put one here, then all of these things have their policy set and would have to only get here by chance. right? So let's do something cool. Let's go back to this large environment. But we're going to set epsilon from a 10% chance of exploration to a 100% chance of exploration. So now Q-learning is doing the Q-learning update rule, but it is literally using a random policy to figure out what works and what doesn't. And you might say, well, random, that doesn't sound very good. Well, look. By doing random things, it observed the rewards that it got from doing random things and still updated this policy to be optimal. Right? So let's toggle it on again. Um, let's clear a tile. Right? You can see them update really quickly now because it's exploring a lot. Let's, uh, let's put in another uh, terminal over here. Right? Look at how quickly that learned to go to that one. Now, up here, let's do one more thing where I set the reward. I'm going to set this one to like 20. And since this is such a large value, people, like, they're going to think, want to go to that one now. right? So that's reinforcement learning. It's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty easy, especially in tabular form. And the last thing I will explain here is that down here, if I just take this and I go 100 or 1,000 and then toggle it, 
What this does is every time you reach a terminal step, the UI starts counting till the next time you reach a terminal step. And it just graphs that average value over time. So this graph is just showing that, OK, we are getting to the goal faster over time. And so that just shows that you are learning. All right. Now, if I do have epsilon equal to 0.1, I'm learning this policy, but I'm not following it. Right? I'm not following the policy. And so if epsilon is 0.1, I'm not actually going down because it's only exploring. But it still learns the optimal policy. It's, it's crazy. The difference between on policy and off policy is important. OK, so that's the user interface. Let's get rid of that. I have, OK, I got plenty of time now to talk about the, um, the assignment files. So, oops, let me see. There we go. It doesn't show up very well in dark mode. So here's the assignment. Um, as normal, you get a bunch of files, but there's only a couple that we care about. So I've already got those open. The first one that we don't necessarily care about, but I just want to show you, is called maps.js. And here's where I define the maps. So if for whatever reason you want to edit one of the maps so that it's changed on loading, you can edit this if you want to. But remember, you're not submitting it to me. It's just for testing purposes. So here um, it shows that uh, this is a clear tile with a reward of negative 1 if you get to it. So remember how I was saying that in the Bellman equation, and, and in reinforcement learning in general, the reward function says a reward is dependent on three things. The state I was at, the action that I took, and the state that I ended up in. But in order to simplify this, the only thing that I'm worried about is the state I end up in. It doesn't matter which action I took to get there because all actions have the same value. And so that's, that, that's this. Um, T is a terminal state, and W is a wall. OK, so that's just the format of all the different maps that get loaded when you click. You don't necessarily need to worry about, worry about that. The next thing that I have for you is this environment class. And this is just kind of the same as before, where it stores the grid. Right? That's it. So um, this dot environment in your RL student class will point to this. And so we've got the grid, we've got a width, we've got a height, and we've got an actions. So whenever you want to iterate over your actions, you can just say this.env.actions, and you can iterate over those. Um, get type will return the type of tile. So that will be um, C, T, or W, if you need to know that for whatever reason. Um, get next state. This takes in an X and a Y and an action index. So just really quickly, wherever we talk about actions in this assignment, the action, the, the action is a single value, which is the integer index into this array. So if I say action 2, then action 2 means left. Okay, so we're passing around actions as an index because we're talking about QSA. So actions are an index into that array. So get next state is uh, x, y, and action index. So you do not need to write the get next state function. I've already written that for you. So nx, that's the next x, ny is the next y. And it just says, if this is out of bounds, or the next tile is, if the next, let me restart. I calculate where I should go based on this action. If that state is either out of bounds or it's blocked, then I'm going to stay in the same location. Otherwise, I'm going to go to the new location. That's it. So this says, if the place I can go is legal, then I'll go there. Otherwise, I will stay where I am. So that's the get next state function. Get reward, this just returns the reward of having landed at state xy. Get xy, um, that's the same. Oh, that you, you won't use that. You won't use this. Um, is out of bounds. You can, you, I don't even think you need to use any of these. They're there if you need them, but I don't think you need No, you might need is terminal or is blocked. For, for one part of the assignment. But that's the environment.js. Really, really easy. Just stores the grid and gives you some helper functions. Here is where you are going to be doing most of your um, work. So let me try and uh, make this a little bit bigger. So yeah, standard warning. All of your assignment code should be in this file. Here's the first um, thing that you need to, uh, to look at. Computed actions are represented by an integer. This integer is the index into the this.env.getActions array. 
Wherever we pass an action in this class, use the integer index. So that's that warning again. And just as a refresher, terminal does not actually terminate an episode. This is a continuing task that never stops. They simply teleport the agent to a random non-blocked tile on the map. This is because we are working with a continuing task, so technically none of the states are terminal. And what I recommend is to do the assignment in the steps listed in the learning iteration function, which I'll get to in a second. So the class RL, um, we have RL underscore student, and this is basically the same as what you've seen before. You have a config. So config stores alpha, gamma, and epsilon. That's what you're going to need for your Q-learning function um, and for your action generation. This.env, that's the environment. This.q, you can access QXYA. XY is the state, and A is the action. So that's instead of QSA, it's just QXYA to make it a bit easier for you. And this.p, that is the policy array, so that is PXYA. And that is the probability that you should do action A at state XY. This.state is 0, 0, so I just start you up in the top left corner. Don't change that. I just want that to be um, 0, 0. But wherever you, whenever you want to know where the agent is, it's just this.state. And this.init gets called. It creates the um, Q array and sets it all to 0 for you. And it creates the policy array and sets it all to equiprobable random for you. So that's what this here does for each xy, um, which is initially empty. It pushes 1 divided by the number of actions. So they're all, if there's four actions, it just gets 0.25 for all of them. OK. Now what you have to do is this learning iteration function. This learning iteration function is called after each action is done in the user interface. So that gets called for you. Do not write any while loop or any, well, there is a while loop, but do not write the overall learning while loop. This is just like um, the other assignments where this is called for you. Q-learning GPI iteration pseudocode. Uh, again, I, I get so many messages about this that I keep stating it. Computed actions are represented by an integer. So they are the integer into that array. So let's look at what we have to do. I'm going to just scroll this over a little bit. So the first thing that we have to do is the teleportation thing, right? So if we happen to be on a terminal state, we have to teleport the user to a random clear state on the board. So what we're going to do is write a little loop that says, while this dot state is not a legal clear state, um, set it to a random legal state. So you just keep generating a random xy within the bounds of the width and the height of the environment. You check to see if it's clear. If it's not, just go through the while loop again and, and try to set it to clear. Um, another way you could do this is look through the whole environment, record which ones are actually clear, and then set it there, whichever one you want. I don't really care. Um, and so this.env.terminal, this.env.blocked, those are the two functions you'll probably use for that to see whether or not it's a, it's a clear state. So a legal state is one that is not a wall or a terminal state. So once you've done that, now you, are in, you have ensured that your state is on a legal clear uh, um, cell. So let me just maximize this so it's a bit bigger. Oh, much nicer. So now what we have to do is select a, an action to be performed from the policy. So select an action A to perform from our current policy. And that is in the this.select action from policy. This will be stored as an integer index of the action. So let's have a look at that. Select action from policy. This function takes in a state. So you're going to be given an xy state. And then you're going to return the maximum valued index. So you're going to look up the policy. So choose the action based on epsilon greedy and the probability stored in the policy. PXYA is the probability of choosing action A at state XY. Choose randomly from all the actions which have the maximum probability and return its index. So we are not actually going to be updating the policy with this epsilon soft thing. We're just going to have the greedy policy update and then do the additional epsilon greedy action step. So the first thing you do here is you generate a random number between 0 and 1. You see if it's less than epsilon. If it is, then you're choosing an action at random and returning that index. Otherwise, if it's not less than epsilon, 
then you have to look through all the actions in the policy, see which has the maximum valued action, and select randomly from the ones which have the maximum valued action. That's it. Not, yeah, not the maximum valued action, but the maximum in the policy. And then you return that. So once you have that, you've completed step um, two. So you're just going to call that function here, right? Let, let a equal select action from policy, and that's going to be based on state, okay? This dot state. So that's what you do. Then you're going to calculate the next state by doing action A at state S, and that's already done for you in this dot env dot get next state. So you have the current state, you have the action, get the next state. Then get the reward from doing action A at this dot state from the environment. So that's, dot, that's just this dot env dot get reward next state. So that's already there for you. Then you update the current Q value based on the Q learning update rule, and that's the update value function, which is, where is it? Update value. So update value takes in state, action, reward, and next state. Those are the only things you need for Q learning. So you will say this.q um, state 0, state 1, action, equals, and then the rest of the Q learning update rule. Okay, so that's, that's pretty easy. That's just doing Q learning update. Oh, I'm bad at max. Here we go. So once you've updated the Q learning, uh, sorry, the Q learning update rule, now you have the current value. So now what you have to do is you update the current policy at this dot state. So th this is update policy. So now your Q values have been updated. So what you do is you say, you iterate through all of your action values. You find the maximum action value. Then you calculate which of the actions actually got you the maximum value. And for each action in A, if A is one of those maximizing values, then your probability of choosing A in your policy is 1 divided by the number of maximum actions. Otherwise, it's 0. So we have pseudocode for that in the slides if this is not um, uh, obvious enough. And then once you've done that, you set this dot state equal to the next state. So don't update this dot state until you've finished the whole thing because that's what the user interface will do. And so once you've done all that, um, that is what is done when you call single iteration. So one call of single iteration calls all seven of those steps, and then that's it. Then it's in another state, and then you do it again. So you click toggle iteration, and that's being called there. And so the only thing left in this uh, class are get max q and get min q. Don't touch those functions. They are used by the, the UI to calculate the color values. That's it. So leave those there. I actually probably should have put them in the, in the, GUI, in the GUI, but they're there now, and I'm too lazy to update it. So what that does, um, if I set the reward of this one to 5 again, and then I crank this up, so it will get the maximum Q value of any, of any of the actions at any of the states. So right now, that's probably this one, which is close to 5. And it'll get the, the, net, the, the minimum Q value. And between the minimum Q value and 0, it goes from most red to white. And from 0 to the maximum Q value, it goes from white to the most green. Okay, so that's how it's colored on the screen. Okay, so we finished with a few minutes left, thankfully. I know that was a lot of information. Hopefully it was intuitive. Um, this is, I was even thinking, what could I get you to do as the grad version of this course to do a little bit more? Oh, maybe you could do Sarsa and Q-Learning. I was too lazy to update the assignment, so you get off easy. This is the undergrad version of assignment five. So this is, you can probably bang this out in two hours, right? Like this is probably the easy, definitely the easiest assignment of the year. And I didn't want to just like, you know, you got an exam coming up, um, which is on April 11th um, from 1 to 3 in EN 1051. Trust what I wrote, not what I said. So if anyone has any problem with that date, meaning a conflict, can't make it, let me know. But basically I put it as, and what I said was give it to